and remind you at 25 minutes without getting too absorbed in your in your talk this time around so go for it thanks sandeep and thanks again to all the organizers for putting together this wonderful workshop uh, steve said in trying times um, so i wanted to tell you today about some work uh, we've been doing in the context of trying to understand real time holography uh, and in particular with applications to replicas and open quantum systems so the broad goal um, of what I'm after is to better understand the real-time gravitational path integral and stationary phase approximation there too, which impacts a large range of questions ranging from computation of causal response functions out of time with various out of time orderings, replica observables in dynamical situations, as we just heard. And often the practical and effective strategy in any quantum system is just to do these calculations with the Euclidean path integral and then analytically continue these results. The strategy, in fact, is our sort of go-to strategy in gravity, where the Euclidean path integral has over the last five decades given us a lot of important insight into a variety of problems ranging from black hole thermodynamics to its upgraded versions, as one said in the discussion, in terms of the Yuta Kanagi formulas and various fine grain entropy quantities from gravity, as well as for the computation of gauge invariant observables in their correlation functions. But from a practical standpoint, it leaves unanswered a very important question, which is what exactly happens in the real-time dynamics, what's going on as the system evolves. And you may ask this question, and over the years, we've come to appreciate that the world of contours that we might want to draw in quantum systems is rich and diverse. We can have causal response contours like the schwinger keldysh contour or more general OTO contours, or we can start drawing replica contours and put operators and compute correlators in replica contours. Here, there's a single density matrix, whereas here there are multiple density matrices. And all of these are things that we can study in, in quantum mechanical systems. And the question really I want to ask is, suppose I give you these contours in the boundary, what do I do in an ADS-CFT context in the box? What geometries compute them? How And what, what can I compute with them? Um, I'll primarily focus for the first part of the talk on the simpler schwinger keldysh contour, and in the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll generalize a bit to the replica contour. Uh, there's interesting things to be understood with these more general contours, which I won't have anything to say about in the course of the discussion. To set up the problem, the real question is, I pick one of these contours as a boundary condition for the ADS-CFT path integral, uh, and uh, say, compute for me from the bulk, which geometry is that gives me the appropriate stationary phase approximation to the bulk gravitational effective field theory. And from there, from compute real-time observables and translate them into physical statements in the low energy effective field. Theory. Okay. So for example, the question that I've been very interested in is basically driving um, the effective field theory of systems with conserved charges. In particular, can we get derived strongly coupled plasma dynamics? So two themes I'll talk about today. One will involve computing thermal observables, the other will involve computing Rennie entropies in time dependent states. So, on to the first problem. So, this is something I've been doing for about a year and a half or two or with um, Logan Igam and various collaborators. Some of these papers have appeared and uh, some will appear in due course. So, let me motivate this problem from a slightly different standpoint, not just the gravity standpoint, but just from a much more fundamental standpoint in quantum systems. Imagine just having a quantum system which is coupled to, to an environment um, and you integrate out the environment. So you sort of start having a system and an environment and you have some coupling between them, you integrate out the environment. For the purpose of discussion, I'm going to take the environment to be holographic and it's very much inspired by this very nice idea which dates back to Polchinski and Faulkner of thinking of semi-holographic systems as useful ways of deriving dynamics, um, uh, effective field theories for strongly correlated systems. If you're asking real time questions, if, you, if you're not doing real solar energy in Euclidean setting, if you integrate out the, the, the environment, then the, what you end up with, as was emphasized long time ago by Feynman Vernon and studied in the context of uh, harmonic oscillators in quantum mechanics by Caldera Leggett, you end up with a, a system Lagrangian, the, 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 the sort of your probe readout systems Lagrangian, which is in some kind of Schwinger-Keldysh double setup where you have 
a set of right degrees of freedom, a set of left degrees of freedom. But more importantly, because you've traced out the, the environment, you have generated some entanglement which manifests itself in, the, in, in terms of influence functionals. And the crux of trying to derive any low energy effective field theory in this context is constraining this low energy influence functionals completely. And I'll focus on an example where you can think of a probe system, which is basically some, uh, uh, a scalar field, let's say, coupled to a thermal holographic plasma. And we want to understand what is the effective field theory that I can write down for this probe system after integrating out the holographic degrees of freedom. As someone said earlier this morning, imagine you want to start slightly go away from the uh, uh, ADS throat and you want to think of the, the, the dynamics from the point of view of the operators that are taking away from the ADS throat. The trouble is that the answers depend very much on what class of operators you couple the to the in the plasma. So there are two cast classes of operators. This we know from holography. And here's where the strongly correlated part of the system uh, of the holographic system is useful. You have, as Steve mentioned, you have operators whose thermal characteristics are dictated by quasi-normal modes as, as Veronica Hogany and Gary Horowitz taught us a long time ago. And these plasma operators come in two classes. I'll call one class a Markovian class. These correspond to rapidly decaying quasi-normal modes where the time scale of decay is set by the temperature. And the second class, which I'll call non-Markovian or memory modes, which are long-lived quasi-normal modes, typically associated with critical phenomena in the bulk, either having to do with presence of conserved charges or phase transitions. And these have short, very long-lived quasi-normal modes, though the time scales I'm going to talk about long-lived are not as long as what Steve talked about just moments ago. I'm going to be mostly focusing on, in Steve's discussion, the slope part of the two-point function. So famously, um, in, this, in this context, Polycastrosan and Farinets showed us that the stress tensor correlator of thermal plasmas modeled holographically have hydrodynamic poles. You see uh, a shear diffusion pole, or if you look in a different channel, you'll see sound modes with attenuation. And these modes, if you, try to in, if you try to integrate out, say you couple your probe system to the energy momentum tensor in the thermal path, as you integrate out the holographic thermal bar, you'll end up with something non-local in the influence function. So it's not a priori clear what the rules of the game are for writing down such influence phases. Secondly, there's a crucial point here, which is that you also want to understand what are the fluctuations associated with such bulk? What are the bulk Hawking quanta from the bulk point of view and how are they encoded in such effective actions? Now, from a practical standpoint, you could ask this question directly in fluid dynamics and various groups have try to address this question over the past decade. I want to sort of put that aside, table that discussion for, for a moment. I've, I've given references here of some of the salient groups that have worked on this, but I want to come back, ask this question from the point of view of gravity and ask gravity the following question. Tell me what to do. And we'll see very clearly that as always, gravity is far smarter and you give us the answer. So we need to compute these real-time correlators. The question is, what do I compute them on? That was a question I posed at the very beginning. And um, again, this question has a lot, lot of history, but the most updated and cleanest prescription for computing schwinger kaldish correlators goes back a couple of years ago to this nice paper by Glorioso, Crossley, and Liu, who argued that what you compute is, is we, since you have two boundary, you, since you have two left and right contours in the schwinger kaldish um, uh, boundary path integral, you, you fill, those, fill that boundary schwinger kaldish contour with a complex geometry, you think of it as a two-sheeted space-time, where you only keep the domain of outer communication, the future half of the domain of outer communication of two copies of the black hole. So I emphasize that I've drawn the full Penrose diagram of the, of the eternal black hole, but I'm not doing the usual thermophile double construction. I'm only keeping these two shaded pink regions. And I've drawn a cartoon here, which sort of shows how I can think of that as cutting open the Euclidean path integral and gluing a two-sheeted geometry that's smoothly glued across the future horizon. So, but from a practical standpoint, all you can have to say is that there's a complex, you complexify the radial coordinate and define a contour which encircles the horizon, picking up appropriate monodromy factors as you go around. 
a very clever, nice way to write it is to, to write it in terms of a complexified tortoise coordinate. Uh, and the, the monotony you pick up is basically coming from the fact that the horizon function f of r has a simple pole if you encircle the horizon. So this logarithmic branch cut it has been normalized to give you a monodromy of two pi as you go around the horizon. Okay, so let's table the discussion of non-Markovian modes for a second and, and look, ask what happens if you do simple probes which are fast decaying. Then the story is very straightforward. You have two boundaries. You just impose sources on both boundaries and compute. So it's a double Dirichlet problem as far as gravity is concerned. And in fact, you, have, you can actually do this calculation pretty straightforwardly, but computing the structure of quasi-normal modes, compute an infalling Green's function, which is with sources described on the boundary and, falling and, and sort of regular on the horizon. And you can use this contour to tell you how the, the outgoing Green's function works by basically using the time reversal inherent in the equilibrium um, thermal state. I've written out the answer for the bulk field in terms of the co a combination of the infalling Green's function and something that you might naturally call the Hawking Green's function because it actually knows about the thermal Bose-Einstein factors if I'm talking about bosonic groups. Okay. And once you have this structure, you just compute directly using Witten diagrammatics, the influence phases. And we were able to do this in, in and there was an earlier work which completed this in the context of probe, probe strings and Langevin dynamics. But you can package this effective open effective field theory of the probe into a stochastic effective action with couplings that can be determined exactly from gravity. So I'm not giving you expressions for the, what the couplings in this effective action are. They're, they're available in, the, in a paper. But what I want to emphasize for you is that these couplings obey all the rules of nonlinear fluctuation dissipation relations that you expect for such stochastic systems to, to have. If you Look, specialized to simple examples that you can do ex explicit calculations, say in 2D holographic CFTs, the BTC background, you can actually derive explicit formulae. These, these formulae that I've given here are given in a great, in low energy gradient expansion, but you don't have to do that if you're working in 2D. And the other important statement I'll make is that there, there's been various confusion in the literature of open quantum field theories of what renormalization effects are, and the holographic system provides a very clean way to disentangle them and gives you some insight, which um, was quite useful to understand. Okay, so that's the story for the Mar for the Markovian stuff. But what about these long-lived modes of of um, which which have to do with the conserved currents or uh, bulk critical phenomena, and what do we do with them? So the traditional approaches to this problem are complicated by the fact that if you want to say study the dynamics of gravitons, which can correspond to boundary energy momentum tensor. Just, you're stuck having to deal with bulk diffure or gauge invariances. And there are three sets of issues which are closely in, interlinked, which, which have to do, which complicate the discussion and have made, led to a lot of confusion in the literature. One is that one tends to typically study this problem in some kind of radial gauge where you fix the radial components of the bulk gauge fields or metric to zero. But this radial gauge is, doesn't play well with the sort of inherent time reversal present in thermal finger Keldys constructs. Second, the radial momentum constraint, which is a constraint it forces, which in, in, in a radial ADM evolution, it forces the difference of currents on the two boundaries to be on shell. Now, what this means is that some set of bulk degrees of freedom are being put on shell. So if you're trying to integrate them out, you're going to have issues with the fact that you're in, you, have, you have put in low-lying Goldstone mode on shell. Sixth, the third problem, problem, which is closely linked, is that even the energy momentum tensor of any current, it has pieces which are both Markovian and non-Markovian. So it's not like it's just purely Markovian or purely non-Markovian, it's, it's some admixture of both. So you need to sort of disentangle all these three facts. And again, so you ask, how do you do this? And the answer is, ask gravity. And gravity tells you a very clean answer, which is don't ask the question in terms of bulk components of, of gauge fields or matrix, just ask the question directly in terms of gauge invariant bulk variables. So if you, for, for those of you familiar with cosmology, it's the same kind of discussion you would have where you talk about gauge invariant variables in cosmological perturbation theory. So for the stress tensor, I'll just say the answer, what happens, you can just parameterize the stress tensor in terms of transfer stressless, 
um, a, a vector and a scalar part, and the trans and this this parts are decomposed with respect to rotations perpendicular to the direction of momentum transfer. And surprisingly, this A decouples all the Markovian and non-Markovian degrees of freedom. B, it actually tells you that each of these components can be described in terms of an effective scalar, which has characteristics defined as follows. Markovian modes have a coupling to gravity that's growing as you go to the boundary, whereas non-Markovian modes are very floppy and their couplings sort of decouple as you go to the boundary. There's a very closely related story to probes of hyperscaling violating backgrounds that people have studied in the context of ADS-CMT, but I'll just advertise that there's a very nice universal template that gravity gives you that all these non-Markovian modes can be modeled as effective scalars proper in, in, in a couple to some background dilata. So effectively, every, mark, every problem that we've encountered so far can be packaged in, in, into, a, into, into a class of scalar, scalar, scalar fields, no mass, but with a coupling that, that is modulated between the horizon and the boundary. And in fact, all that matters is not the precise nature of the coupling, which, which, which enters into the actual, cup, actual coefficients in the schwinger keldysh effective action, but rather how the coupling behaves as you go towards the boundary. So this, this parameter M that I've defined here basically de demarcates the range of Markovian and non-Markovian fields. Fields with M greater than minus one are, minus, are Markovian, fields with M less than minus one are non-Markovian. And I've given a table here of various components from coming from gauge fields and gravitons in various uh, uh, examples that you can sort of decide yeah, you can basically compute whether they're Markovian or non-Markovian. But gravity also tells you something more. It tells you that because these non-Markovian modes are floppy near the boundary, you should quantize them with different boundary conditions. In fact, if you directly take the decomposition of the, in, in these polarization modes and plug them into the Einstein-Hilbert action with the gibbons hawking boundary term, you are told naturally by the dynamical principle that these non-Markovian modes should be not satisfying, not quantized with the Clay boundary conditions, but with double Neumann boundary conditions, okay? In other words, you shouldn't integrate them out, rather you should keep their field values and not their sources. So you don't compute the generating function of the non-Markovian modes of correlators, but rather compute uh, an, uh, their Legendre transform with respect to waves of the non-Markovian operators. And this is an input that comes straightly out of the gravitational action. This, this I emphasize because this causes some confusion. People say that, you know, you could, are, are we imposing these boundary conditions by hand? The answer is no, this is a, an input coming from Einstein-Hilbert gravity plus boundary terms. And various earlier works have, have, made, these, have, have made these observations, um, but as far as, we, as far as I know, this is the first time that one is able to be able, one, we were able to see this directly from the point of view of the, of the bulk dynamical variational principle. So in other words, what gravity instructs you to do is to compute something called what we call the Wilsonian influence phase, where you turn on sources on the two boundaries for the, non, for the Markovian fields and waves and for the non-Markovian fields and compute this Wilsonian effective action. And I'll just flash here the answer for the stress tensor dynamics in N equals for super young This is a problem that I mentioned because has a rich history going back 20, 20 years. And here, here's, the, here's an action that, that comes out of this discussion. So I've broken this up into polarization data. So the tensors are characterized in, in four dimensions by two polarization um, boundary sources. Um, this, is non this is Markovian. The vectors are characterized by two polarization, uh, so, uh, two polarizations, and they are, this is the momentum flux. And the sound mode is characterized by a single mode, which is basically the, the, sound, the sound field in the, in the bulk. And the action has three these four pieces plus non-Gaussian terms I'm not writing. And the, the, there's a piece which comes from the fact that the black hole solution has background free energy. So this is the background pressure term which corrects itself into a, a, a sort of what, what in, in a paper about six years ago, we call class L hydrodynamic action. So you could reproduce that on the nose from gravity. 
uh, that there it was conjectured based on input from um, quasi normal motion with gravity, but here you can sort of just derive it from, from the bulk uh, directly. And then the bulk action for the, for the remaining terms is basically some, some um, structure of the kind I showed you before for the Markovian um, fields. Since I'm just writing Gaussian terms, there's a piece which is a, 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 a in retarded propagator corrected by appropriate Bose-Einstein factors degree of fluctuations. So the one term gives you the re retarded Green's function, and then you mark, and then fluctuation dissipation tells you that the, the fluctuation is given by Bose-Einstein factor times the retarded Green's function. And here are the expressions to quadratic order in gradients for the retarded Green's function for the Markovian part and the inverse uh, Green's function for the uh, non-Markovian part. This, this zero of this inverse Green's function um, basically tells you where the shear dispersion relation is re recovering the famous result of e tower S is one over four pi. And you can do more, you can do sort of other modes in the problem. And other people have also commented on, on deriving this effective action in, in, in previous discussions. So this is what you get if you start by inputting into the discussion, this complex geometry. So in the remaining um, a few minutes, I want to tell you a little bit about what you can, how you can justify these complex geometries as appropriate saddles. So this is some work I had done previously with uh, Aitha Lefkowitz and Ji Dong, but more recently I've been working uh, with uh, my student, Sean Colin Ellerin and folks on Santa Barbara, and which came out in these two papers. So here I'm going to generalize the discussion and look at one uh, for, the, for, the, for the case of Seisuk of uh, discussion, I'm going to generalize it by allowing uh, non-trivial spatial dependence. So I'm sort of taking one piece of this uh, bracket uh, piece that shows up in the replica contour and showing you the time evolution forward and back in the cat and the bra, but also indicating spatial information so that if I want to compute reduced density matrix elements, I can cut open this path integral, impose boundary conditions on the cuts and compute appropriate boundary reduced density matrix elements. Once I have these red, um, density matrix elements, I can compute Rennie entropies by doing boundary replica trick. And so the contours will be look similar to this, except that there is spatial information in terms of where the cuts, which parts are glued, which bras and which cats are glued to which, which ones. If you take this boundary contour, you can write down an unsatz for the bulk geometry where your boundary contour, um, your, your boundary Cauchy surface is extended into some bulk Cauchy surface with the entangling surface extended into a co-dimension two splitting surface. And there are a couple of interesting regions, causal domains in this region that I want you to focus on. So associated with the region A in the boundary, there's a homology surface, which is an extension of the piece of the bulk Cauchy surface that is connected to A. The entangling surface extends into a splitting surface, which I said is a co-dimension two surface, and it extends out in the boundary, uh, into the bulk. The past domain of dependence of the homology surface, I'll call the homology wedge. This, if we're talking about entanglement entropy or one Neumann entropy in a fixed background, this would eventually become the entanglement wedge, but for now it's just, or the past of the entanglement wedge, but for now it's just, the, it's just some piece in the ansatz. And then there is a causal path of the splitting surface, which would be important, which is which I've called the middle image. So you take this ansatz and then you take as gravity to do, do, the, do its job. You glue various pieces of this ansatz together as dictated by the replica construction. So cats in and bras in a, of the same uh, density operator are glued a, in, in the, in the complement region and cats and bras are glued cyclically between different replica copies. So I'll just focus on replica symmetric saddles and a priori just declare to you that you have to have complex Lorentz signature matrix because if you look at what the splitting surface is doing, there are, it's, it's a co-dimension two space-like surface, but it's, it's normal it being time-like, has a time-like component, but it has to switch directions between going from one replica to another and that it can't do in a smooth fashion in a Lorentz signature geometry. In fact, the, the discussion 
of what it needs to do can be understood by looking at the splitting surface and working in a Gaussian normal chart around the splitting surface as was emphasized in the Euclidean discussion by Lefkowitz and Maldacena. And I have adapted to the Lorenzian normal bundle, uh, light cone light coordinates, I've put tildes here because these are light cone coordinates that are positive in the space-like domain. And all, all you need to know is that the metric is smooth and real in the homology uh, region, in the homology wedge, but it's complex in the causal past, if, you're, if I'm talking about a ket or causal future, if I'm talking about the bra um, of the uh, splitting surface. And you can give analyticity conditions in terms of these light cone coordinates that the metric in the, in the local neighborhood of the splitting surface depends on fractional powers of these light cone coordinates, but in a manner that's analytic explicitly coming from replica symmetry in the first two of these combinations. But what's crucial is that as you cross the light cone and go from the homology wedge to the um, Milner wedge, the, this combination in light cone combination ha has to cross the la um, light cone and the light cone coordinates cross the light cone. And you have to pick, you pick up branch cuts, which have to, you have to regulate by an IAF prescription. Okay. So the so, IAF prescription. Sorry to interrupt. Mukun, sorry to interrupt. You are yeah. at the 25 minute point. Yeah. Thanks. I'll, I'll be done in precisely two minutes. Okay. So the, there's an IAF prescription that one can give, which has also been discussed in this uh, recent paper by uh, Goto et al. And with that IAF prescription, you can just compute in the bulk, the bulk path integral in the stationary phase and show that the effective action, the on-shell action for the, which computes the entropies is given by the imaginary part of the, of the gravitational action. Why is there anything imaginary? The answer clearly has to do with the fact that we are jumping light cones. So there's a piece that comes from crossing the light cone of the epsilon prescription. In, but more importantly, the real part, which would have given you a pure phase in the gravitational uh, path integral, cancels between bras and kets. So there's the, un the net answer is purely ima imaginary. You can understand this um, as was pointed out long time ago by a suitable complexification of the gauss bonnet theorem. In fact, you, if you, by putting appropriate regulators around the splitting surface, you can prove that the einstein hilbert plus gibbons hawking term evaluates to a purely imaginary term proportional to Euler character of this, of this half disk times the area of the splitting surface. So I just flashed this slide because this was a third day post computation that uh, uh, my student, Sean, Sean Colin Ellen did, which is to basically use this technology to reproduce some results that were computed in the Euclidean context by Tom Faulkner for computing Rennie entropies in holographic 2D CFTs for multiple disjoint regions. I've just drawn here two disjoint regions, which, which are labeled by their endpoints. And what I've done is also I've, I've relatively boosted these two regions with respect to each other. And this is one important example because although you can write a single Cauchy surface that sort of straddles this joint regions, which is space-like, the corresponding bulk geometry is the, 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 the you have to actually compute an extremal surface to, to get the bulk Rennie and the bulk von Neumann entropy. And, in, in, and therefore, this is a good test of the, the Lorentzian prescription. In this case, you can actually do the computation by basically working in Pfeffer and Graham coordinates, where all you actually, the only piece of data you need to know is how to build the branch cover of this double cut plane in the boundary. And once you, and I'll just say in interest of time, that the co computation can be done and you reproduce the answer quite beautifully. In fact, the answer can be obtained in two lines if you use the complex Gauss bonnet here. Okay, so in fact, all, all I need to tell you is that the physical answer depends on how much energy so you need to put at every um, branch point where the twist operators are, in, are, are placed to close, the rim, to close the boundary into an appropriate Riemann surface if you're working in the Euclidean space. And the variation of the Rennie entropy with respect to the endpoint is simply captured by the, the amount of energy you put at that point. So I just flashed for you in the last half an hour, 
progress we, have, we made in understanding real-time gravitational path integrals in two different contexts. And I think there's a lot more to do. And in particular, many questions that have been discussed in, in earlier talks um, and uh, uh, sh should be better understood from the point of view of this real-time dynamics. So with that, let me stop. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mukund, and thanks for keeping to time. Uh, floor is open for questions. I don't see uh, any hand up yet. Uh, oh, Juan, Juan has his hand up. Juan, sorry, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. So the way you describe the real time gravitational replicas, it, it sounded like you were doing this on the original geometry, but maybe I, I was confused. Um, no, so I, that's why I expect I, that the replica would involve a different geometry. Okay, go ahead. Yes, yes, you're, you're, you're right. So, so, I mean, I was too fast on that one. I, that's why I said this is an unsense. We still have to solve the bulk equations. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and, and then the, the geometry is modified both in the uh, homology wedge and it's modified everywhere, right? Correct, correct. Okay. It's exactly like what you would expect by putting, so you could, you could do the exact same calculation that you, you and I thought did by imagining that you put here a cosmic brain of some tension right. and right. allowing that to back react. But right. the key point is that there's a well-defined variational problem, which you can, with boundary conditions that are described in the Lorentzian context. So okay. you, your discussion had an advantage that you could say the covering space was smooth and smoothness was clear what it meant. And so all, all I'm saying is that that analogous notion is an appropriate analyticity statement in this light cone coordinates. Okay. I see. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, I don't see. And Bin has a question. Can I ask a question? Sorry? Yeah, Please I Bin have a question. Please. Uh, 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 Mokun, could you remark on why the uh, geometry was real uh, inside of the, what, what you call homology wedge? Yeah, so the, physically, the way I think about it is that this is, so let me give you the sort of heuristic answer, which you can justify. The homology wedge is basically coming from the Euclidean section. It's, it's purely space-like with respect to the boundary description. So, so here, there's no, you could just take the Euclidean answer and continue. So it's like saying, you know, if you, if you want to, for example, think of CFT correlators. If you want to get real-time correlators, you could just analytically continue. But the CFT correlators are guaranteed to agree with the Euclidean correlators in the, in the corresponding Euclidean domain. And the homology region is precisely that Euclidean domain. Mm. So, so the, all, all the non-trivial action is crossing this light cone. It, uh, it, maybe is there something interesting if I, for example, put this twist operator to be, instead of space-like, to be time-like? You want to put, you want to compute some two-point function of twist operators that are time-like separated? Yeah, um, yeah. That's a good question. I, I think it can be done and it's probably related to discussions that people have had in the past of, um, computing uh, uh, what are called, uh, the name escapes me, but it's related to the discussion of geodesic Wheaton diagrams. Um, and uh, I'm sure one can make a statement, but I haven't thought about it to make give you an immediate answer. Maybe someone else does. Yeah, because in that case, the naive uh, gamma will be complex, right? Correct. The ga gamma would have to be, um, that's correct. So I accept. Yeah. I think um, Henry, Henry has yeah. a something question. in the same in the same vein as Jemin's question, but slightly simpler is not to compute time-like separated insertions of twist operators, but have a splitting surface and then have some other operator insertion to the future of the splitting surface. So, so far you've described the geometries all to the to the past of the splitting surface, but uh, if you wanted to insert some operator that was just maybe a probe thing that's not gonna back react to the future, is that mm -hmm. something that's straightforward to describe extending the geometry to the future of the splitting surface? Um, 
I mean, so we, we'd have to do the following. If you want to compute correlators of operators in a state at a time later than where the state has been prepared. So, so here I'm pre preparing the state at this on this Cauchy slice, right? In the boundary or in the bulk, I'm preparing it on a single Cauchy slice. If you tell me how to evolve the boundary to that time, let's say you inserting no other sources, I just do a standard Hamiltonian evolution and then insert the operator, then I think we can we can do the corresponding bulk statement and do exactly what you're asking. Yeah, so the thing I had in mind was you have some initial states, you evolve it forward in time, you assert some twist operator, you evolve it forward in time again, you insert some probe operator, and, and then, then, oh, I guess you have yeah. to just, I guess this is different if you're, whether you insert that yeah, you have to operator tell you something on one sheet or another on what the time ordering is, but okay. Correct, exactly. exactly. Okay, we are actually out of time, but there's one more hand. And uh, since it's the last talk, uh, let's uh, anyway take the question, but then that would be the last. Alexei, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me well? Yeah, I can. Yes. Um, yeah, my question um, is about uh, possible applications. So in the recent years in condensed matter literature, people discuss this uh, phase transition when you couple your quantum system to... Um, to an external one and essentially perform a series of um, of measurements. Mm -hmm. So this is um, um, like an example where, when you have an open quantum system and they see a phase transition depending on the uh, uh, rate of these applied measurements. So mm -hmm. have you thought about analyzing this uh, setup or using uh, your, your techniques? I think it can be done. Um, so. To, to be honest, we, I mean, there's something I have been thinking about with with a with a with a student in in Davis, uh, Frederick Gia, uh, which is to do correlated noise systems, which which would pick up something of the kind you're asking. So you you have two probes in an environment, and you ask how does the noise correlate them. Um, I, it was partly inspired by some something along the lines you're asking, um, which is to think about random tensor networks and doing projective measurements at various nodes of the random tensor networks to prepare the random tensor network, um, which gives you cross correlations. The one issue I have is that it requires us to be a bit more careful about what other geometries and saddles contribute. Um, and I don't have a full answer for you yet, but I think in principle, um, my, my tentative answer would be yes, you can do it, but once one understands not just the schwinger keldish contours, but also perhaps OTO-like contours or replica schwinger keldish type contours, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I see, thank you. Okay, I think we'll have to leave it there. Thanks a lot, Mukund, very much. Let's all clap Thanks, and Sandeep. thank Mukund. And I hand over to Nathan and the organizers for any last uh, words they have for today. Okay, so thanks very much. So we'll meet again tomorrow. Um, just for people who had some problems with the sound on the videos from the first day, they've been replaced. So, so the videos on the first day should be okay now. Okay, so we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thanks a lot.